So in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the March 14, 2022 meeting of the Policy Review Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's Policy Review Committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams Live on the BCPS website. To conduct this meeting by virtual means, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Clark or Ms. Howie if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat fe feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Clark, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Yes, Ms. Causey. Dr. Kager. I see she's present, but I don't hear her. Um, Ms. Han. Present. Ms. Ms. Mack. Present. Ms. Rowe. Present. Mr. Thomas. Here. Thank you. Okay. I think I'm missing something in my script here. Do we need to call for the presence of staff as well? Yes, yes ma'am. Dr. Boswell McComas. Ms. Charlie Green. Ms. Howie. Here. Dr. Zarchin. Present. Dr. Holmes. Present. Ms. Ferguson. Present. Ms. Lewis. Present. Dr. Wistet. Present. Ms. Stansberry. Present. Ms. Hahn. Present. Did I fail to um, identify anyone? Thank you. Um, this is Erin Hager. I, I, I can hear you all now. I'm on here. That's and fantastic. I see Ms. Causey has joined us. Good afternoon, everyone. These are the first um, items on our agenda or policies requiring review because of MSDE mandates. Um, the first policy is policy 5480, pregnant and parenting students. Uh, Dr. Boswell McComas, please proceed. I don't see Dr. Boswell McComas on the line, um, but I believe that Ms. Ferguson is here. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be presenting policy 5480, pregnant and parenting students. Um, this policy is a newly proposed policy written in response to the updates to Comar's education article 7-301.1, educating pregnant and parenting students. Comar mandates that LEAs create a policy that is modeled after MSDE's policy to include standards for attendance, makeup work, lactation support for students, student support services, training, publication, and communication. Baltimore County Public Schools is committed to ensuring that all students have equitable access to rigorous, high quality, and effective instruction in a supportive environment. Policy 5480 ensures that pregnant and parenting students are allowed to participate in all aspects of the educational program while meeting some of their unique needs. Policy 5480 will, will promote the beliefs, precepts, and values of the board that prohibit gender discrimination of any type in educational programs and activities, including bias against pregnant and parenting students. The board believes that pregnant and parenting students must be allowed to participate in all aspects of the educational program, including all academic, physical, and social components. 
the enactment of this policy will not only ensure that BCPS is complying with COMAR regulations outlined in, outlined in MSDE's pregnant and parenting policy, but it will also provide pregnant and parenting students with access to a range of support and activities to include excused absences, opportunities to make up work, accommodations for instruction, lactation support, and designated support staff in schools. Um, the impact that this policy may have on current district operations um, is that uh, each school will need to identify a lactation space with a refrigerator. The law requires each school to designate a lactation space that includes at least one seating option with a flat surface and electrical outlet nearby to accommodate placement of a breast pump device and to provide lactating students with access to a refrigerator located reasonably close to the private lactation space. The law specifically states that schools are not required to construct an addition or new space to a school building. Um, and that's policy 5480. Any questions? Ms. Rowe, I have a question. Yes, Ms. Ann. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Ferguson. Good afternoon. Um, the policy mentions that this applies to the mother, father, or guardian um, student. I'm wondering um, about students that take on parenting responsibilities. For, for instance, for siblings, um, we have a lot of students that are, take on um, an enormous amount of responsibilities in the home for younger children. And does this policy account for that or are we providing for the needs of those students as well? Could you speak to that, please? Um, this policy is specifically related to pregnant and parenting students. Um, certainly we have support services for students who need additional support. Um, in ensuring that they show up to school. Uh, but this particular policy is related to uh, pregnant and parenting students. So it, it does apply to parenting students, and so it does not apply to students that are taking on parenting responsibilities. I don't see that language in the uh, model policy. So if the board wanted to be more inclusive to address the needs of those students, you see that we would need to expand this policy because this language does not include that group. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Um, no, I'm not making that recommendation. I'm not sure how we would define a student who is just, is an older student, older student who is older sibling that's taking care of their younger sibling. Um, so as um, Ms. Uh, Ferguson has noted um, in the definitions of the model policy, parenting student is a student who's the mother, father, or legal guardian of the student. So as she has indicated, it's while a, uh, an older student may indeed have some sort of responsibilities, it's not clear in the model policy uh, that an older student who is under age 18 would indeed be a legal guardian. Thank you, Ms. Howie. I, I understand. I'm, I'm trying to, okay, I wanted to see clarification because we have students in our system that absent a mother, fa biological mother, father, legal guardian, or an adult taking on one of those roles, we have students that take on that role that may not fall into one of those categories who need extra supports. So my the purpose of my asking this question is if the board wants to provide these additional supports to those students, would they be provided that under the policy as written? So it sounds like the answer is no. If I'm understanding that correctly, according to the definition. The definition in the model policy says legal guardian. That is what staff is recommending be repeated in 5480. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hager, Dr. Hager, sorry. <laughs> Don't worry. 
Um, I'm really excited that this policy is uh, is to see it kind of all put together is really great. Um, I just had two questions. One is a clarifying one. Do we currently not provide lactation space for our teachers and staff? So that students, no, so no, this this ensures that that space is available for students. This policy doesn't address uh, staff. I know, but do yeah. we do we have a space in every school building or office building that is available for teachers and staff who are breastfeeding to to pump? I I'm, I would not be the person to respond to that question. That that sounds like something that would go to HR. I. I can address that, uh, Dr. Hager. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, typically what is it is required and typically what happens is the principal at each school um, works to designate a location uh, to find a space uh, for that. I'm just thinking that this, you know, could not be a huge change if we already had the accommodations for teachers and staff. Um, and one thing that I saw in the model policy that I did not see in our policy is that the lactation space may not be a bathroom or closet. Um, would it be possible to add that language specifically into the current in our into our policy in writing? There are um, the most of the language um, is in the policy, but there are some 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 of the languages in the rule. When it gets into the specifics. Yeah, again, I, I'm, I'm a believer that if, if we believe that it should be something that has legs, it should be in the policy. And so that's just something that seems it's in the model policy and it shouldn't be a, a closet or a bathroom. So again, that, that would be that would be my only my only potential change. So that's all. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, just responding to the previous question, I'd encourage that board member to make a motion on that matter, and I, I would support that. Um, m my question was, where do we currently provide some of these kind of supports in, in our current policies re regarding our, our pregnant and, preg and parenting students? You know, where are some of their supports right now? I know this is a new draft policy, but what other policies could I reference? Some of this would oh, be. In policy 5120. Mm -hmm. 5120 and uh, rule 5120. Okay, that relates to excused absences. Okay, so under 5120 um, and the excused absences. Okay, thank you. That was my only question. Thank you. Um, Ms. Mack? Yes, I have a question about um, the model policy section 1A2 and A3 that talks about absence or attendance? Yes. Um, so my, I, I had a daughter who at birth was very sick and was transferred to the hospital and spent 30 days in the hospital. Um, obviously, I was not a, well, actually, I was a student at the time, and I was a college student, and I worked with my professor, but my question is, in about, in 2017, we changed our grading policy to take out attendance as a requirement, but at a certain point, a student who misses a lot of time, especially a student, a young student with a baby, because we all know having children is very hard is not going to be in school enough to get the subject matter that he um, that she would need to be successful. So what are we going to have in the policy that speaks to the fact that at some point being out for the things that many of us have to take time off because of kids would preclude the student from being successful in school? I'm not sure if I follow your question. So the policy says um, that a pregnant or parenting student must be allowed at least 10 days of excused absences after the birth of the student's child. And of course that, you know, is very obvious because that having a child is a pretty labor intensive physical thing. And then pregnant or parenting students must be allowed excused absences due to the illness or medical appointment of the student's child including up to four days per year for which the student may not require a note. In my case, my daughter, if I was a student who had a baby, 
I would have missed 30 days after her birth and then significant time every month after that because she was very severely ill. Do we are we going to speak to the required attendance for the student to be successful in this policy? So the policy um, has here that what I'm reading is excusing all absences due to pregnancy or parenting related conditions. And must be allowed excuse absences due to the illness or medical appointment of the child. Mm -hmm. Which could be a full quarter of school. My, my question is around the fact that we need to set students up for success and students who are not in school for even the most legitimate reasons may not be learning what they need to learn to be successful. If I may um, chime in to to support the answer, um, I think the, what you mentioned in the policy is said they can do up to four days without a note. Um, it seems to me that beyond that, they would need to provide some type of documentation. No, and I understand that, but I'm still saying in my case, I would have missed so much school that I would not have been successful because I was more concerned about taking care of my child than I was about attending school, making up work and learning what I needed to learn to be successful. Right. And so in the um, in the rule, there is a section related to make up work um, that includes retaking a semester, participating in an online credit recovery program, or allowing the student six weeks to continue at the same pace to finish at a later date. So the, those details are in the rule. But to Dr. Hager's point, should they not be in the policy? It's so members like of the committee, as you're aware, um, the uh, practice of the school system, of staff and of boards uh, that predate you has been to include visionary language in the policy, enactment and procedural language in the rule. Uh, the model policy that has been provided to us from the state is indeed that a model and the state simply wants to see those elements in whatever we designate, whether that be the board policy or the superintendent's rule. And it is staff's recommendation the board can accept or reject it, that those items that are procedural be in the rule. And while Dr. Hager has a point that it has legs if it's in a policy, that doesn't mean it is procedural. Uh, that doesn't mean that isn't procedural, excuse me. So if the board wants to place procedural language in a policy, it is not staff's recommendation to do so. That has not been the board's practice but it's ultimately your policy. So may, Ms. Um, Ms. Roy, may I respond? Yes, Ms. Beck. Um, I apologize because I didn't see the section in the model policy of makeup work. Um, and I think the language is very clear there of what options a student would have to be academically successful when trying to, you know, balance all of the the concerns and um, of being a, a new parent. Um, I would like to see that language in the policy because we we don't have the rule. Ms. Mack, is that something you wanted to make a motion on? Yes, I, I would make a motion. Um, I move that the proposed policy 5480 include the section two language that speaks to alternative options for students to make up work in ways other than home and hospital teaching. Is there a second? Second, Ms. Hen. Is there any discussion? Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Yeah. So, just a question. So, for clarity, uh, we don't have the the rule attached in board docs. Is there any way that we could look at the language for how the the rule would be what was going to be written for for 
making adding it to the policy because I do agree. I I think that sometimes uh, looking at some of our policies, you know, the practice of being very visionary, it makes it feel as though as board members, you know, we really can't do anything with the policy to make a change in the school system, as I think is our role as board members. So I do think that although that has been the previous way of the Board of Education to be very visionary, I do think when I look at policies in Montgomery County and Howard County, Anne Arundel County, and I'm comparing them to our policies, that we need to be, we need to look a little deeper and we need to go beyond just that very visionary lens. So I, I, am, I am in support of the intent of Ms. Mack's motion, but you know, I don't, I don't just want to add this language into the other policy. I want to make sure that it's using our same kind of language and it's maybe what the rule would have would have stated. So I'm wondering, can we have the rule provided to us maybe in the chat or add it to, attached to board docs or something, the, the draft rule? That was so being our practice has been to complete the rule once the board has completed the policy. If indeed the board makes changes to the policy, then we'll adjust and make those changes to the rule. Uh, as a draft document that's not completed, particularly if the board decides to make changes to the policy, we will adjust accordingly. It's the board's policy. If you wish procedural language in a policy, that's completely the board's choice. I would remind the board, however, given the amount of time it takes to pass a policy, that it is possible that once you have changed a policy, it will be very difficult to amend it, but that is the board's choice. Uh, Ms. Kazi, you had a question to the motion. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask a question earlier um, as to exactly what paragraphs in the model policy were not included in the draft poli policy represented by um, staff today um, because so everything that is in the model policy will be in either your board policy or the superintendent's rule we sought clarification from msde who indicated that quite frankly it didn't need to be a board policy at all it could be a superintendent's rule or our uh, or what they called a regulation they did not have a preference simply that it was system-wide so all of the components that are in MSDE's required draft policy are in either the policy that you have before you or in the proposed superintendent's rule. Again, it's the board's policy. Uh, please let the staff know what your preference is. We're happy to comply. OK, thank you. And I would just um, dovetail with Mr. Thomas in that I have uh, in several PRC meetings requested that the draft policy be attached to uh, board docs for the committee, but also that the draft, excuse me, the draft rule um, be attached to board docs for the committee to consider. And then uh, that could be more efficient in terms of, we would see that those other sections are included in the rule, um, but also to have the the draft rule attached to board docs for the full board uh, when the full board is uh, considering the policies. So I don't know, um, is that something, um, Madam Chair Rowe, that the I'm committee sorry. should vote on or so want to just right make now, that? Right okay. now we're getting off into topics that are not related to the current motion on the floor. If you could focus to your comments on the current motion on the floor, um, we can cover those other issues once we dispose of the motion. The motion is I move to amend policy 5480 to add language that the model policy to allow pregnant and parenting students to make up work by retaking a semester, participating in an online course credit recovery program and allowing the students six weeks to continue at the same pace and finish to date. Finish at a later date. Oh, and finish at a later date. OK, OK, so thank that's you. the motion that we're discussing right now. Um, yes, is to amend the policy so that it includes language like this. OK, thank you. And in. Um, clarifying a statement that was made earlier about um, being con being aware of if procedural things are put into a policy, it may be difficult to change later, um, isn't it? 
possible that the board, the full board can vote to waive the two reader process um, in limited cases and change policy in one meeting. I guess that's that for board council. That is possible. I believe in the 29 years I've been here, that's happened twice. OK, thank are there you. Any, are there any more questions related to the motion? Mr. I well, believe Dr. Hager was next uh, and then I'd like to speak to my second, if I may. My sure, comment that. was about the process discussion, so go ahead. OK, um, thank you. My, my final comment is that I do support making the policies more specific um, because what we've seen is that there's been um, confusion about what the policy says or that the policy is so vague that it does not uh, really achieve the mission and the vision of the board. So thank you. OK, Ms. Han. Thank you. Um, normally I would apt to include details in the rule because they do um, apply to the implementation of the vision. However, in this case, um, in reviewing the language that Ms. Mack proposed, um, these speak directly to um, the, the vision itself and the options that these students should have available to them to making up the work. And it's the substance that speaks to, that, that directly supports the vision rather than the procedure of implementing the vision. So I believe that's an important distinction that we need to include in the policy itself. And for that reason, I'm supporting adding it to the policy. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Clark, would you call a roll on this motion to amend policy 5480 to add language from the model policy to allow pregnant and parenting students to make up work by retaking a semester, participating in an online course credit recovery program, and allowing the student six weeks to continue at the same pace and finish at a later date. Ms. Causey? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Han? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Um, Ms. Howie, if you could ask staff to devise that language into the policy and bring the policy back with that language. Are there any? Um, so, um, I'm sorry. This row, uh, the normal process is that once uh, the committee makes an amendment, it then goes to the full board as amended. I would strongly caution against delaying this any further because if it is further delayed, then we will miss the deadline that has been imposed on us by the state. OK, if, if you're comfortable doing it that way. Um, that's fine. I was I misunderstood the process. Um, OK, uh, Dr. Hager, you had a motion. Um, yes, I just wanted to add the language we talked about earlier, so um, I move to amend policy 5480 to add the language to section 3A2. The lactation space may not be a bathroom or closet. Is there a second? Thomas. Is there any discussion on the motion? Uh, Ms. Clark, would you please uh, call the roll? On the motion, I move to amend 5480 to add language to section 3A2. The lactation space may, may not be a bathroom or a closet. Ms. Causey? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Han? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. Are there any further amendments to this policy? I have one, Ms. Rowe. Ms. Han? Yes. I move to amend policy 5480 by inserting into the definition of parenting student after who is the phrase or who is acting as is there a second miss Han? would you put that in the chat please sure 
Is there a second? All right, hearing no second, the motion fails for lack of second. Uh, are there any more amendments to this policy? If there are no further amendments. Madam um, Chair Rowe, I had put in the. I'm sorry, go ahead. Chat that I had a. Um, go ahead, Ms. Coffey. I had a question. I just have to get to the screen. So in the draft policy, it says uh, on page two, paragraph three, implementation, the board directs the superintendent to implement this policy to include procedures concerning makeup work, lactation, attendance, lawful absences, and support for students. And I would move to add language after students that says per the model policy from the Maryland State Department of Education in 2022. Period. I'm sorry, so Ms. Kazi, your, your motion is, oh. I'm not sure that's a proper motion because what we're basic, we need to actually put the language we want in the policy, in the policy, not have the language in the policy, reference a model policy someplace else. Do you have the actual wording that you want in the policy? Well, that is the, that is the language I want because the, model policy has specific recommendations for each of those one word items in the list. Sure, but we don't want to reference a model policy in our policy as being our policy. We want our policy to have the actual language of our policy. So can you reword your motion so that it contains the actual language you want in our policy? Well, then I would have to go back and add several several statements for each area that that implementation phrase is referencing. I don't think our policy should say do what's in the model policy. <laughs> do we our policy has to have language that actually says what we want people to do. Well, so I hear what you're saying, what you're saying, but at the same time, we also have legal references. We also have citations of Comar. We also have uh, citations, um, you know, of what do you law. So, what are you actually trying to? What's your what's your well, angle here? What are you actually trying to? My concern is that MSDE um, spent time and energy and receiving input from um, stakeholders developed the model policy and it is I think it would be appropriate to have that as the guideline instead of to have no reference um, when recommending when directing the superintendent to implement. Currently it the Statement says the board directs the superintendent to implement this policy to include procedures concerning makeup work, lactation, attendance, lawful absences, and support for students. But it gives no reference or guidance as to what those procedures should be based on. And the model policy does, and you want our policy to have the same language that's in the model policy in that respect? Is that what you're asking for? Yes, because so far we've uh, addressed makeup work, issues of lactation, but there's also other areas of training, support for students, um, also issues with the absences. So I'm open to suggestions um, of the wording. Um. Ms. Howie, do you have a suggestion as to how we could word a motion that would get to the point that Ms. Kazi is making? I'm not sure what the goal is, ma'am, but uh, first of all, I do have a slight correction. Line 31 should read uh, Roman numeral four for implementation instead of Roman numeral three. And then I would direct the committee's attention to Roman numeral three 
um, at line one uh, standards, which indicates what sorts of procedures the superintendent uh, will implement and the reason for implementing those procedures, which is stated in the model policy about safeguarding the rights of pregnant and parenting students, as well as ensuring their academic success. So absences uh, in number one, lactation in number two, uh, designating a lactation space uh, as well in number two is what Dr. Hager asked be amended, um, designating a staff member as a resource person, training is in uh, number four, Number five, making sure students are informed. And number six, creating safe and supportive environments. Uh, those are concepts that are in the model policy that according to your draft policy, you are now directing the superintendent to implement procedures in those areas. Uh, Ms. Cosby, are, are there other areas that you're trying to include in this policy? Well, that's why I asked the question earlier, which segments of the model policy were not included in the draft policy? Well, this would be a time to do that since we don't have a motion on the floor. So if you would like to ask that question now. I did, I did ask that question. It was, the answer was incomplete. Could we have a, a more complete answer to that? as to why certain sections were not included, Ms. Ali? I believe I'd also already addressed that concerning the difference in the dichotomy procedure, implementation, vision, the direction you'd like the system to take. Again, if you want both of those in this document, then that is the board's decision. That is this committee's direction to and recommendation to the rest of the board with respect to those elements that are considered procedural or deemed procedural, those will be in the rule and the elements that you see before you are in the policy. We have provided to you the sample policy from MSDE so that you have it uh, for your purposes to be able to make informed decisions to direct staff. So I'm not sure what other information uh, the committee would like to have. So Ms. Causey, is it your intention that you want to do a motion that would include all sections that are in the model policy in the current policy draft? Um, at a high level, yes. The, the issue that came up related to this that Mr. Thomas started and I followed up on is it would be helpful at these meetings or in advance of these meetings to have the draft rule also available because then it would be clear that procedural things as uh, recommended by staff are in the rule. But as it is now, we don't have the draft rule. So if it were in the draft rule, then that might be fine, but. I think it's difficult to draft a rule for a policy that's never existed before and we're creating the policy. I, I believe Ms. Holly's correct. We need to decide what we want in the policy. Is there any consensus on the committee about including all sections that are in the model policy on a high level in the current in our policy? Or does anyone want to make a more specific motion to that in regarding specific sections? I mean, I get what Ms. Causey is asking for, but we need a motion that's worded differently than just do whatever the draft policy says. If I may ask another question, Ms. Rowe, if no other board yeah. member has a comment at this time. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Um, Dr. Hager had a comment. Can we let her okay, go, go first? Ahead. Sure. Um, yeah, it, I, for a while now, I've been wanting to say that the model policy is a, is a pretty good policy that the MSDE pulled together, and I feel like it has a lot of, there's a lot of really good things in here, and it feels like it takes more work to me to parse out you know, well, this will be in the policy and this will be in the rule instead of just putting it together into a succinct policy following the model policy. And so I, I, I feel like maybe we're, I know that we're on a time crunch and this is um, something that we need to legally pass and get through. But in the future, when we're given a model policy, it just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me to kind of pick things here and there because of this whole vision procedure thing. And a lot of the things that are not in our policy that are, that are 
going to end up being the rule to me aren't really procedural procedural so much as they are policies. And so I, I don't know. I, I get what, what Ms. Causey is saying for sure. I feel like it's kind of at the 11th hour and we have to put a lot of trust into the superintendent's rule that it will fulfill all the requirements of the policy um, and that that degree of trust you know is on us to, to have but I, I do think I agree with everything what everyone's saying about not having a draft rule is problematic and simply not not just including the, the model policy components seems seems to be more work than than needed to be done in my mind. Um, but I also feel like we're we maybe just need to, to pass this policy and trust that the rule will be you know fill it all out completely. Ms. Hen. Um, Dr. Hager summarized my thoughts on this, so I'll I'll leave it at that. I I think we do have another opportunity if the rule really misses the mark to send the policy back. And I hate to do that, and I know we're under the deadline, but I mean that is another fail safe. So I think in future it's important for committee members when we're reviewing the policies and the recommended policies to come to the meeting with actual language in the policy ahead of time as possible. I'm not saying you have to share that with the committee ahead of time, but a motion to just copy the model policy isn't a motion to add specific language to the policies. And we can't really get anywhere in this committee if the motions don't speak to the specific language. So if we could focus on that in preparation in future meetings, I think that would eliminate a lot of confusion. Are there any other um, amendments to this policy? Okay, hearing none. Um, policy 5480 is moved forward for first reading as amended. If a committee member wishes to vote on first reader, um, why is that in this script? Okay. All in favor of policy 5480 moving to first reader as presented, please answer yes when your name is called. Those opposed, please answer no. If you are not ready to vote, answer pass, and you will be called on again after the roll has been completely called. Ms. Clark, will you please call the roll um, to move policy 5480 as amended to the board? Ms. Causey. No. Dr. Hager. Yes. Ms. Han. Yes. Ms. Math. Yes. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Mr. Thomas. Yes. Passes. The affirmative vote has it and the motion passes. Policy 5480 is moved forward for first reader um, as amended. The next item on the agenda is policy 5580, bullying, cyberbullying, harassment, and intimidation. Um, Mr. Jarchin, please proceed. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to bring forward for your review policy 5580, bullying, cyberbullying, harassment, or intimidation. At this time, I would like to welcome Ms. Lewis and Ms. Ferguson, who will be presenting policy to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zarchin, and good afternoon, everyone. Policy 5580, bullying, cyberbullying, harassment, or intimidation is necessary to meet the Maryland State Department of Education mandate that school systems update their policies based on the updated MSDE model policy prohibiting bullying, harassment, and intimidation. This policy is further necessary as it addresses behaviors that can impact students and their learning. Policy 5580 guides the system's work in supporting a safe and supportive environment as articulated in the COMPASS by supporting students' abilities to participate in learning environments that are free from bullying, harassment, or intimidation. We know that bullying, harassment, and intimidation can negatively impact academic achievement and a student's physical and emotional well-being. This policy provides students, 
parents and employees with information about their rights and responsibilities and the recourse for students who are targets of bullying so that they can engage in a physically and emotionally safe environment. This policy supports the board's commitment to safe and secure environments conducive to learning and belief that bullying, cyberbullying, harassment, and intimidation are disruptive. It prohibits these behaviors and retaliation against anyone who reports these behaviors. Enacting this policy brings BCPS in alignment with the Maryland State Department of Education model policy and further reinforces the system's commitment to identifying, reporting, investigating, and addressing all forms of bullying, harassment, or intimidation. Questions, please. Board members, other questions? Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I just had a few questions about the policy. Um, the first one is on page two, line six. Um, it talks about, it says, bullying is unwanted demeaning behavior among students that involves a real or perceived power imbalance. Now, uh, on section 3A1, which is right underneath of that, it says an imbalance, it describes what an imbalance of power is, but we don't describe what a perceived balance of power is. So I was wondering, is that just automatically implied that a perceived imbalance of power is when a student feels like there's an imbalance of power that it, it maybe isn't actually there? Or should we add more language to define what a perceived imbalance of power is? So yes, um, and yes to if you would prefer that we elaborate on perceived imbalance of power, we can do that. And I move that language be added to section 3A1 to include a definition for perceived imbalance of power. That's in the chat right now. Um, <laughs> Is there a second? I'll second that. Is there any discussion? So there is a definition of perceived imbalance of power in the model policy. In the model policy on I'm sorry, sorry it's imbalance of power. That's my um okay. that is my uh error. It's simply balance imbalance of power. Okay. Uh, Miss Roe, may I comment on my emotions? Yes. Thank you. I just think we should define what this perceived imbalance of power is um, to ensure that, you know, a student who is in that situation, there is a definition for that. And we don't just state that. And because for me reading that, I, I was unclear as to, well, really what is a perceived power imbalance? So I just, I think it's important that we define that. I, I agree with Mr. Thomas, and, and I'm going to speak to my second. Our policies need to be clear for every person who reads them so that somebody could say, oh, well, it means this, this is an example, this is that. Um, and I do think that if we need to have a definition that's a little more concrete than just stating perceived imbalance, because that could be interpreted by multiple reasonable people in many different ways. Dr. Hager, you had a comment? I, I think it's it's a good catch on Mr. Thomas's part. Um, it seems like the definition that's there is really more about the real imbalance of power, but adding something about how one may perceive an imbalance of power, um, I, I think it's a great idea. I. I'm curious to see what language people come up with for it. Um, I, you know, <laughs> but it's a uh, it's it's a good good catch. Are there any other um, on this map? Yes, um, I have looked at the policy as it exists. I've looked at the proposed changes, and I'm looking at the model policy. There is a section in the model policy starting on page two, communication regarding the availability of the bullying, harassment, or intimidation reporting form. Um, and then there's an entire section that moves um, all the way through, even on to page four. Does, did I miss in our policy sections like um, inform staff about the availability of the bullying, harassment, or intimidation reporting form for use during opening of school meetings and then periodically throughout the school year? Uh, 
Is that somewhere that I, I didn't see it? So section four in the standards. C. Four, is that what you're looking for? Inform students and parents annually of the board's bullying, cyberbullying, harassment, intimidation policy. It's implementing rule and the availability of the bullying, harassment, or intimidation reporting form in the student handbook. Okay, I'm sorry, can you tell me specifically where that is? So on page, a sec it's a Roman numeral four standards. Let Are we think. talking about the, pol I'm sorry, in the policy itself? Yes, in the policy. Okay, sorry, hold on. Sure. Okay, so Roman numeral four. Letter C. And number four. And five. All right, I I'm not seeing it, but Miss Rowe, if you can go on to somebody else while I look for it, I just I'm not seeing it at all, so I need to. OK, so we need to process the motion that's on the floor. Are there any other um, comments to the motion? I move that language be added to Section 3A1 to include a definition for perceived imbalance of power. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I just wanted to state that, um, you know, when the definition is added to this, you know, we still have two readings. So if we don't agree with the definition, we can always change that in uh, in, in our full board meetings. Thank you. Okay. So um, members of the committee, I would sorry, not, Alex? I do not believe that um, unlike the amendments that were made to 5480, which were a uh, specific language that were voted on uh, by the committee that language that's left up to staff, particularly language that is not um, in the model policy in any way, should be sent forward to the full board without this committee seeing it. So this, at least this amendment would need to come back to the committee. But again, the committee would have to act with deliberate speed uh, once this uh, policy is brought back if this amendment is passed. Understood, Ms. Howie. Are there any other comments to the amendment? Ms. Rowe? Yes, Ms. Hen. Um, I had one. So I'm I'm looking at the, the draft policy and I'm wondering what the relationship is to the language um, in parentheses on 3A1 is to, in relation to the motion where it defines imbalance of power. So there's a difference between imbalance of power and perceived imbalance of power. And Mr. Thomas's motion looks for a definition for what is perceived imbalance of power. Okay. Versus an actual imbalance of power. I have to say I'm confused on the difference too. I'm not sure that I could define there even being a difference. Given that imbalances of power are all perception anyway. Ms. Rowe. Yes, Ms. Causey. Could we ask staff to uh, provide clarification or a def uh, an example of perception as considered legally? So what, what would... Um, support a perceived imbalance of power, what would support, so for instance, in, in assault, what would what would support a perceived threat? Well, I believe this is most in passes. It's going to go back to staff and they're going to have to come back with us for some, with something in the line of a definition. Okay, well, that, that would be helpful to me to, decide whether to support this. Are there any other comments on the motion? I just okay. want to say, um, if we don't come up with a definition, then I think we should strike perceived imbalance of power. But so uh, that language is in the model policy. That's the definition that was taken verbatim from the model policy perceived imbalance of power. So there's no definition in the model policy of as to what perceived imbalance of power means distinct from an imbalance of power? No, ma'am. 
Okay. Um, Ms. Clark, can you call a roll on the motion um, that language be added to section 3A1 to include a definition for perceived imbalance of power? Ms. Causey? Yes, I would. Yes, I would like to see a definition. <laughs> Dr. Hager? I'm going to say no. Ms. Han? No. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry, what was the count? Did the motion carry? Yes, 42. Okay, the motion carries. Um, so that amendment carries. Okay. Are there any other comments on this policy or amendments? I, I do. Um, and both at the same time. Ms. Hen? Yes. Um, I move to yeah. amend 5580 by striking the language in 1B from the sentence, the board prohibits bullying, cyberbullying, harassment, or intimidation off school property. Um, I move to strike that the administrator, or from the phrase, um, the administrator determines, so that the sentence reads, the board prohibits bullying, cyberbullying, harassment, or intimidation that creates. And Could I'll you put that in the chat, please? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, that's when I need to wait to reread. Ms. Rhoda, while it's being added, can I ask a question or? Well, wait, I wait. First, I need to read it out loud and ask for a second. Okay. You guys enter what you're writing or is my network slow? I'm not seeing anything yet. I just see Mr. Thomas' comment. I'm typing. Not you're still typing. Okay. I just wanted to see if I had a network issue on my end. No, it's coming. It's getting one more. Okay. I'm hunting and pecking with one hand for Danny. I understand. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, Julie. Okay. Um, Ms. Hen moved to amend policy 5580 by striking the administrator determines from the board prohibits bullying, cyberbullying, harassment, or intimidation off school property that the administrator determines creates. Um, is there second. a second to that? Second. Okay. Ms. Causey. Are there, is there any discussion on that amendment? Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I'm just wondering, uh, why was the language that the administrator determines creates um, added to this policy? I'm sorry, you said why was it added? Yeah, why Why was it th that the administrator creates? I was just curious. So somewhat, I think it was added because in looking at activities that take place off of school property that have a nexus to the school, then someone needed to be responsible for determining that and then acting on that behavior that happened off campus that had an impact on the school. And so the committee that developed the policy wanted that responsibility to rest with someone. And so they made it the administrator. Thank you. And so when it says the administrator, is that referring to the school's entire administration or is it just like the school principal? Is that who the administrator is? It could be the principal, it could be the assistant principal if they were the person taxed with 
investigating a particular incident and determining that it did indeed cause a disruption in the school. Thank so you. We left um, it so open to be both. Oh, thank you so much. So then I, I really do agree with this. I don't think, you know, cyberbullying, harassment, or intimidation that's off school property. You know, I, I think we have to look at the individual communities and where this cyberbullying or harassment would be taking place. We have to look at the schools. And I, I do agree that maybe the administrator should be the one who determines if that is a substantial disruption and would warrant a sort of um, consequence or, or disciplinary measure in the, in the school building. I, I don't think we can just say we can't. We, the responsibility has to fall to someone and, and who's going to be investigating that and who's going to be determining that. So I, I feel like that language is, is important and I and I won't be supporting this motion for that reason. OK, I'd like to speak. Um, May I speak to my motion, Ms. Brown? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ms. Han. Thank you. Um, so I believe that, well, I have a couple of comments. Um, one, I, I think that this can occur on and off um, school property. So I think the way that the policy is worded is somewhat confusing in that it seems to address only um, those incidents that occur off property. So I, I don't have a motion prepared that addresses that, but I'm putting that forth to the assembly um, for suggestions. But as it relates to off property, um, my concern is that when we leave it up to our administrators to determine whether bullying harassment um, occurred or, or cyberbullying or intimidation occurred, I feel as if the, the victims need to determine that. And that by um, placing that on the administrator to indicate whether or not this this happened does a disservice to the victim. And, and that was the immediate sense I got from reading this. Um, also, it, it does a disservice to teachers because you can have something substantial happen um, away from school property that greatly impacts the classroom. Um, and an administrator may not determine that it, it affects the school um, overall, but it does impact the learning environment. And that's contradictory to what we, our vision that's expressed in this policy about ensuring that every student learns in an environment that's safe and secure, conducive to learning. So policy statement A, policy statement C under section one, I feel that this section B, this specifically this sentence is in direct contradiction to A and C, which is why I put forth this motion because one, we don't want to um, doubt our victims They've, they've been through enough. It should be up to the victim as to whether or not this occurred, not the administrator, and also our teachers um, to determine whether or not the learning environment is um, jeopardized by what happened. So for that reason, I put this forward. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to comment on the motion. I agree with Ms. Hen's motion, but for a very different reason. So. If the if the policy were to state off school um, that if it were to state the board prohibits bullying, cyberbullying, harassment, or intimidation off school property, that that creates a disruption. That allows someone to determine what is a disruption, but then it is always school administrators who make all of these decisions, and that always gets articulated in the rule. But if we say in the policy that the administrator determines then we're creating a situation where an administrator's possibly subjective opinion about what could create a disruption is in our policy. And I think that could possibly compromise parents or victims or anyone's appeal rights. So if, if we have a student who did something that it's determined create a disruption off school policy and they appeal a disciplinary action to the board, and our policy says that the administrator determines, then it really doesn't matter what anyone else thinks, objectively speaking about what actually happened. The fact that the administrator determined that it created a disruption means that our hearing examiners are gonna say, oh, your policy said whatever the administrator thinks is what happens. And so then any appeal would fail because of that language. So I think um, the administrators determine everything. It's what they do, it's their job who determines whether something is a disruption will be outlined in the rule. 
but by putting it in our policy, I think it makes the student discipline appeal problems process somewhat problematic. And potentially problematic for due process of the person who's being disciplined. So I'll be supporting this motion. Um, are there any other comments to the motion? I'm sorry, I've lost track of the chat. Uh, who was the next person? I think Dr. Hager was next. Dr. Hager? Ms. Causey. Um, so right now in the rule, it, the, it talks about the process through which I, I should I should have brought up the rule before I started speaking. I apologize. Um, so this just takes this language from the rule to the policy about the administrator overseeing this. Is that correct, Ms. Howie? No, ma'am. This is the language that was or the concept that is in the model policy mm -hmm. um, and I've reproduced it in the chat. The school administration will address incidents that occur at school or have a connection or nexus nexus back to the school setting. You know, and I, I, I saw that and I, I agree with that. I guess um, what I'm getting at is that, that this is the current way that it's, it's done. So I, I'm aware of multiple incidents that have happened off school grounds. It involves, you know, a meeting at the school with the administrators, you know, and then there's a discussion about whether this will come into the school building or whether it can stay off school grounds. And so the administration is, is key to that because they, you know, they are part of it. Um, I guess I have less of an issue with it because I've seen it also go beyond the administration, you know, where, where parents don't agree with the administration's decision and it's gone into a different, um, you know, up the chain. I, I don't feel that this blocks any ability to move it forward. You know, I, I could be wrong, but this, you know, I like things in policies that are, are usually in rules and I, 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 so I have less of an issue with this, I guess, is, is all I'm saying. So just to put this concept in context, although I'm, I'm dating myself, which I tend to do, there's a very early uh, cyberbullying case out of Montgomery County. I believe it was Baramani, would have been 1995 or six. And that, in that case, you can imagine that long ago, the, the concept of cyberbullying was, was quite new. In that particular case, um, I'm sorry, it wasn't Barmani, that was the second case, but it was a Montgomery County case, middle schooler. In that particular case, um, young women were rated on physical attributes. And at least one of the young women who was, uh, was rated indicated that she felt ashamed and as if people were looking at her, did not want to come to school. So clearly off campus, but clearly had an impact on this young lady's ability to access educational services and the rights that she had under Title IX, which again then were not terribly well uh, documented um, and the, the law was very new. So this, this uh, concept of a nexus um, that something that happened off campus uh, a child can be disciplined for on campus and the question of whether or not there was a particular impact on educational services and access to educational services is what is uh, is what is explained here and is what is anticipated here that if a student because of something that has happened in the virtual world cannot come into a school building then the school system needs to be able to take action, uh, whether it's in the virtual world or in the real world, whether or not it's been a fight off of school grounds that makes its way into the school or whether or not it's been um, a student who has been harassed online. So that's, that's why the nexus is so important and so key. So in, in your discussion, members of the committee, I would just urge you to keep that concept uh, in the policy because that is the concept that permits uh, local school systems to be able to discipline. There must be a connection. Um, Ms. Causey. Ms. Causey, you're muted. Thank you. If I could ask the motion to be repeated, but also to read the how the policy would read if the amendment were passed. Okay, so the 
the amendment was I move to amend 5580 by striking the it, quote administrator determines from the board prohibits bullying, cyberbullying, harassment, or intimidation off school property that the administrator determines creates, and, and then it goes on. So instead, it would basically say the board prohibits bullying, cyberbullying, harassment, or intimidation off school property that creates. Okay, thank you. So can I ask a question? How is it determined now? Who determines now? What creates? So typically that would, yeah, that would be the administrator um, who would be responsible for investigating it. So it just specifies the person who already does it. So when they determine it, it doesn't mention it there, but there is an investigation that happens yes. that brings about the determination. Correct. Okay, thank you. I'm going to rewrite. Mr. I believe I'm next. Yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Okay. Thomas. Thank you. Another concern I have is that if we remove that the administrator determines, then we don't really have a definition for what the disruption will be in a school classroom. You know, I think if we were to remove that, then we would then need a definition for what a disruption is, because right now, as was stated, we're allowing our administrators to determine what that disruption is. And to my previous comment, you know, that's a school by school basis, what a disruption is. And I think we, if we are going to remove that, then we also need to define a disruption. Um, so I'm, again, completely fine with having the administrator determining that it creates a disruption because to previous points, uh, you know, the administrator does, will conduct an investigation to see what kind of influence it would have in the school community. And uh, I, I, again, I, I just think that it's, it's, it's fine if we're just going to continue with the administrator determining whether or not it is it going to have a significant disruption. Thank you. And I, I, I sorry, I'm I sorry, go ahead. I want to say one last thing. Um, I think that you know, from experience with administrators and, and being in a school building and witnessing cyberbullying and witnessing the conversations that occur with administrators, that they do an excellent job when it comes to recognizing these cyberbullying and trying to, to, and when it does determine a, when it does create a disruption, uh, being able to mitigate that with these investigations. Um, so uh, I, I think we also need to recognize that like, if we're allowing the administrator to determine these, we are giving the victim or the person who was cyberbullied against, the opportunity to be heard, the opportunity to move forward, the opportunity to uh, address this. Um, and I think that we're just, I think that by stating it in the policy, we're really nailing down that we are trying to ensure that cyberbullying, harassment, and intimidation are not occurring in our schools. Thank you. Ms. Hen. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Um, and, and Mr. Thomas is right. We we have outstanding administrators, but I the purpose of our policy is is not to leave that to chance. It's to address our vision. And our vision is that every incident is handled um, the way we we want it to be handled every time. And my concern is not the actions that our administrators take, it's the inaction. And in Ms. to speak to Ms. Howie's example, you know, actions are great and and that was handled appropriately. Um, what this does is um, requires action. It, it takes the determination out of it, I guess is what I'm saying. It takes the guesswork out of it. It requires investigation. It requires follow up. It requires action. It doesn't allow for judgment to enter into whether or not um, reports of bullying, cyberbullying, or um, judged to be not serious or to have an impact on the learning environment um, by taking that subject subjectivity out of the equation and says, in you know, by saying yes, this can have an impact on on school and it needs to be investigated because it potentially will, and let's treat it as if it will. Um, just as it, when we have a threat to a school on social media, 
um, the police department takes every single threat seriously, whether it's credible or not, until it's proven otherwise, it's treated as such. So my concern with this is that what if the wrong call is made and it it is something that has a serious impact and an administrator determines otherwise? That's my concern with this language. And by removing that, what I hope to express as our vision is that every incident is treated as seriously as we take a physical threat to a school building and the safety of our physical safety of our students. Um, this should be treated as seriously. Thank you. Ms. Mack. Wow, uh, Ms. Hen kind of touched on one of my questions was, would this language preclude the police department from making any type of determination? Um, because it says administrators, but I do know that sometimes the police department, if it's a credible threat that they feel like puts students at risk, that they would make some type of determination. And then my concern about administrators making that determination is, as we have all learned in taking implicit bias training, we bring bias through the lens um, of how we were raised and things like that. And what if administrators in all schools are not doing the same thing or perceiving things the same way? Um, you know, that concerns me greatly um, for how this type of thing is handled. So just a comment and a question. Okay. So police and administrators may conduct separate but parallel investigations. So if it's something that has occurred that is criminal behavior, then the police are going to do what they do in response to the criminal behavior, but the administrators are going to do what they do in response to our discipline code. So both things can be happening, or it may be just an administrative issue and not a criminal issue. Thank you. Ms. Causey. Thank you. So I really appreciate the conversation uh, because I think it's getting to uh, the genesis of, of concern. So first to comment that this paragraph about which the Ms. Hen made the motion um, on page one, paragraph B, is different from all of the uh, ensuing standards, definitions and standards that are on page two and three um, and four that speak to the on-campus uh, when participating in school sponsored activities on school property or held off school property, etc. So, um, and there's also the definitions included in what is bullying, what is cyberbullying, harassment, or intimidation. Um, <clears throat> so, I think that the issue is the real issue is that when we're talking about bullying, cyberbullying, harassment, or intimidation that occurs off the school property someone needs to determine that it will create or would might create um, a substantial disruption to the orderly operation of school in order for it to be addressed by the school administration. For instance, as someone commented earlier, if there was uh, a fight that occurred outside of school and it's reported to the administration of a school, those administrators may determine to separate those students from classes they might otherwise be in the same space. They might decide, um, you know, that uh, there needs to be some other arrangements made, uh, like the conversations before they come back to school or something like that, um, to address how that off school property um, brings di potential disruption inside the school. And I think that it does require clarification who makes that determination. But I think to Ms. Hen's point, it's also important that there be some level of evaluation of each report. And if uh, staff could speak to where 
the bullying and harassment that happens on campus as outlined on page four, where each report is evaluated. Maybe that's in the rule and we're just not seeing that. In fact, every incident inside the school does get evaluated and these that come from outside of the school, someone needs to determine that there's a potential disruption to the operation of school for it to even be evaluated. So yes to each report of bullying is investigated and there is an investigation form that administrators use in investigating that incident and identifying the consequences for the behavior. It also speaks to what they did in their investigation, whether it's interviewing students, whether they're interviewing witnesses, if there are parent meetings, if the school resource officer was involved. So all of those things are things that administrators are checking off as they go through the investigation process. And that is information that they have to submit along with the bullying reports that they submit. OK, thank you. And um, the only other comment that or question I was going to ask is the draft policy says the administrator. Now is the uh, thought that that is the school administrator? Because we have. Yes, a lot of administrators, school administrator, yes. So that that might need clarification in my mind. I'm not going to make a motion because we have one on the floor, so. Dr. Hager. I believe you had had a comment that you put in chat. If you could repeat that out oh, loud. Sorry, yeah, I am. Um, when Mr. Thomas was mentioning cyberbullying, I just um, wanted to mention that this isn't just cyber, but um, the many, um, the accounts that I, I'm more intimately aware of involved, you know, off campus fights and things like that. Whereas uh, the conversation went on, we discussed police involvement. You know, all these things happen and the administrators gather together, do an investigation. Um, and, and these are all uh, practices that are in place currently. So I, I, I do like including that language in the policy, given that it is a common practice. So um, that's why I, I'm not supporting this motion and I'd like to see administrators stay in the policy as is. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. My, my question was, why are we only including off school property here in instead of on and off school property? On property is included later in the policy. Oh, well, thank you, Ms. Causey. Um, and also, I just wanted to also, if we could, Ms. Pa, Ms. Causey's question, she was, we learned about the form that the administrators are, are filling out. Um, and I, that was uh, uh, when there's an incident that occurs and they have to, and they're responding and, and doing their investigation. I think that's an incredible form. Um, and I, I'm glad that I, I know that that gives them more confidence in our administrator since they're doing this. So uh, thank you. OK, uh, Ms. Clark, would you please take the vote on the motion to amend 5580 by striking the administrator determines from the board prohibits bullying, cyberbullying, harassment or intimidation off school property that the administrator determines creates? Ms. Causey. I believe Ms. Hen had a comment before the vote took that place. wasn't for the motion that's for something else oh okay it, thank you it was on the motion but we can oh it was i'm uh, miss Han, did you have a comment on the motion or can we vote i i was just going to comment to dr hager's um comment in responding that procedurally the motion does not um exclude administrators from the process but rather the subjectivity of of them from the um investigation that was the intent okay. so thank you okay miss clark you can proceed with the with the roll call miss causey yes dr hager no miss han yes miss mack no miss Rowe. yes mr thomas no okay the motion Three. does not carry If there are no um, further correct, I'm sorry, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I just wanted to, I moved to insert school um, to line 15, page one, between the and administrator. 
Um, so is it your intent that someone in the schoolhouse make the determination and not necessarily someone in the central office? No, it, it's, it's my intent to, to specify the type of administrator, the, the school, the school administrator. That okay. would be the individual who we're referring to in this as administrator. Is there a second? Second, Ms. Causey. Is there any um, discussion on the motion? Hearing none, Ms. Clark, will you please call the roll on the move to insert the word school in between the words the and administrator, page 15, or line 15, page one. Didn't we just strike administrator? Okay. Um, no, that motion failed. Okay, Causey, Ms. Causey? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Han? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Okay. The motion carries. And Ms. Rowe, if I may. Yes. I just wanted to make sure. So on um, page five, or sorry, page three, line 20, um, it's discussing harassment and it said it says harassment including all these things and it says including sex so when it says it includes actual perceived negative actions that offend ridicule or demean another student with regard to sex does that does that mean sexual harassment or can that be interpreted from that verbiage would staff answer please so that would be the way that I would interpret it. And that is the exact language that was in the model policy. OK, thank you. I just wanted to make sure of that. Thank you. OK, Ms. Causey, and then this is the last um, thing we're doing on this policy before we take a vote because we do need to move on. Thank you. So um, in the model policy, they had they referenced two forms. Um, and so my question is, we don't have any forms attached. Were there forms attached to board docs that I missed? So the question is, are the are forms in alignment, um, including everything that's in the model policy forms? It is their form. It is the MSDE form. OK, thank you. And then I did not see a reference in our draft policy to the online bullying harassment form I didn't see a reference to it in the uh, direction to the superintendent around um, addressing it in the board handbook or um, in any other way. So again, it, you know, there, there's a lot of syntax in here. So if I missed it, please, if you can point that out. But we have heard from stakeholders that uh, they were unaware of the online form. They were unaware of the paper form. And certainly we know people are much more digitally um, engaged now, so that online form would be, in my opinion, very important to make sure is in the policy, referenced in the policy. Ms. Han, you had a motion? I do, and I'll make it quick. Um, it's the same line we've been talking about. Um, I move to insert the possessive after um, Mr. Thomas's amendment to change to school administrator. Um, that the school administrators and then insert the word investigation before determines. So Mr. Thomas's motion didn't carry, so the language does not say school administrators. My bad. And I thought this did carry. This yeah. did carry. This did carry. I'm sorry, did it? Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I confused it with the other one. Okay, so, so you're moving to add the word school prior to or school administrators investigation determines is yes. the language you. Is there a second? Second, Matt. Discussion? Let's let's make this really quick, guys, because we have a lot to do and this meeting must end at six. Staff cannot be here past six. Can we vote? Okay. Ms. Clark, can you please take the vote? Ms. Causey? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Han? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Ms. Rowe, may staff answer the question of is the online form 
uh, referenced in the draft policy. So it doesn't specifically call it the online form. Um, it does talk about its availability on the website, and that is the online form on the website. And the online form will be linked in the, the superintendent's rule. Is it possible to have the online form link in the legal references um, and references area of our policy? So if you look under implementing rule mm -hmm. uh, on page seven of the draft policy, the implementing rule not only is linked to the superintendent's rule, but there's also a link there to the form. OK, thank you. Um, I'd like us, can we vote on moving this policy forward? OK, so the bullying, okay. excuse me, just to follow up. So the bullying, harassment or intimidation reporting form. That goes to the online form as well as a printout paper version. My understanding is that the link that is here is to an online form. OK, because Ms. Rowe, if you could just see that there's consensus that there with the committee that there should be a link to online reporting and uh, to people that want to print out a paper copy and fill it so out. Cur so currently the form that's online is one that you print out once you've completed it online. IT is now working. That was something we lost with the ransomware attack. And so IT is working to reinstate that process where the. Well, I'm not sure. No, let me not speak to that. We are trying to address that concern that the ransomware attack, um, the capability that we lost with the online form that went directly to an administrator when it was completed online. And the parent did not have to print the form out and then submit it. Is there not a state law that requires the online form to be electronically submitted? No. Do the online forms that people fill out, they go to the administrator only? Do they also go to MSDE? No. I thought we had a reporting requirement to the MSDE. So at the end of the year, we report data from those forms from all of our schools to MSDE. But the individual forms do not go to MSDE. We complete a report at the end of the year that goes to MSDE. OK. Ms. Rowe, rather than make a motion, I would just request you ask if there's consensus that the board wants to make sure parents can access online through the website and. Uh, uh, and that it's you know publicized the same as the. A paper form. I believe Ms. Howie just said that that is the way it is, that there's a link at the bottom of the policy and there's a link to the rule and a link in the rule. Is that what you stated, Ms. Howie? Yes, ma'am, but there's also a link in your policy to the form. OK, so this is this is what is happening. Um, OK, thank you. Can we vote on this policy now? Ms. Rowe? Yes, Ms. Howie. I'd like to comment specifically to the form. Yes. The the policy should include again so it, that it has teeth that we provide an online form that can be submitted directly to an administrator. Do you have language to that effect that you'd like to amend the policy or are you asking staff to create language and bring it back? I'm asking staff to create language and bring it back. So you want the policy to require. That the form be electronically submitted as opposed to printed and submitted. Yes. Is there consensus? Does anyone object to staff bringing back language like that? Uh, Mr. Ms. Thomas, I don't object. I just have a question about that. So I know that on the thing that says that the, the mandatory deadline was March 2022 and we've that we've had it. An, and a, an extension granted for us. When does that extension expire? 
And if we were to request that language, would we be moving past the extension date? So the initial extension date was for, uh, well, the initial date that was provided was March, but the state did not provide the, the model language until late December. So there was no way we could have processed the policy in sufficient time. The extension was to uh, May, I believe, but I also, if I'm, and please correct me, Ms. Ferguson, uh, if I'm mistaken, but that recently the state indicated we had until the end of June. But the last I was told was May, so I'm happy to be corrected. Is that correct, April? I did not get an update in that um, date that it's due. No. Um, I just want to comment that Mr. Thomas's motion passed, which will require staff to bring it back to us anyway, because there's no language for perceived bullying. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, then it didn't. I I I'm, I I am in consensus. I agree that yes, I agree. Yes. Okay. So so no one objects. So our your next meeting, members of the committee, is May 9th which will not allow you to get this passed by the end of June. But I will double check the date and it is on your agenda today to discuss whether or not to have another meeting in April. Um, but you are going to be, there may be some problems with getting this done in sufficient time. And in my opinion, again, the, the committee is, is free to disagree. This policy is something that the public, and you should hear your public comments on, given the concerns about cyberbullying that have been expressed by parents. So I would not recommend, again, the board can do what it wishes, I would not recommend pushing this policy forward without public comment. So we already have this policy is already going back to staff to address language. Um, Ms. Howie. So where are we at with this then? We don't need to make a motion to send it to the board if it's going back to staff. Is that correct? Correct. If okay. again, I would not, I do not believe it is wise for staff not to have specific language um, for the committee to vote on. And so the issue is whether or not you wish to wait or whether or not you wish to send this forward um, and reconsider Mr. Thomas's motion about uh, the perceived imbalance of power. Um, but you do need to be aware that there are scheduling uh, problems if this comes back. You're going to have to take it forward. Ms. Rowe, may I make a recommendation? Yes. Um, if you could determine by consensus that the committee is um, agreeable to staff developing the language and bringing it forward to the full board at the next meeting without a recommendation, then we can evaluate uh, the language of both uh, Mr. Thomas's earlier motion and uh, Ms. Hen's um, request. Does anyone object to Ms. Kazi's suggestion? I do. I would rather have another meeting um, in April or at least have the discussion. That is Does that anyone? is a possibility if we have a meeting in April also. So um which I'm open it, to. Are there any are there any other objections? Uh I, I also think that we should have another meeting in there. I, I was looking at the agenda item for later on in this meeting, and I think that um, you know, we we can we can do this if we were to choose one of the March dates. Thank you. Okay. Well, let's do that then. Um, can we move on to the next policy? This one's going back to staff, and then it will be brought up in another agenda. If um if committee members have additional things about policies, our we're not going to finish this whole agenda in this meeting and we didn't finish the last one in the last meeting and I've not gotten any email questions about any policies prior to the meeting that are being covered. 
There's a lot of questions about this that could be taken care of through email that are just requests for information. And then could those answers could be attached to board docs. So if committee members um, in preparing for these meetings could ask informational questions and email that can be attached to board docs, I think it would help our meetings move along. Um, policy 5220, attendance and excuses presenting. Um, Dr. Boswell McComas, please proceed. Is Dr. Boswell McComas here or is there someone else who's presenting this? I am and I have uh, Miss Ferguson is with us. She will present on behalf. Thank of you, doctor. You're you're welcome. Sorry, I wasn't here earlier. Nope, that's fine. All right, good. Still good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to bring policy 5120 for your review. Policy 5120 20, attendance and excuses supports the Maryland compulsory attendance law Comar 7-301. That requires children between the ages of 5 and 18 to attend school regularly and sets the attendance standard of at least 94 percent. Policy 5120 supports the safe and supportive environment priority by providing a framework for creating a culture of attendance where students have the necessary supports to succeed. The establishment of a culture of attendance supports the building of, a po of positive relationships and high expectations, which reduces disproportionate outcomes and increases attendance and graduation completion rates. Policy 5120 promotes the beliefs, precepts, and values of the board by setting the expectation that all students be present at school each day, either physically or virtually, because attending school regularly is linked to academic achievement and ensuring that students will graduate from high school. The enactment of this policy will not only ensure that Baltimore County is in compliance with the code in Maryland annotated regulations, but it will also reinforce the message that students who attend school regularly perform better academically, are more connected to the school community, and graduate from high school. For this uh, current um, iteration of this policy, the recommended uh, changes were to align the policy statement with the board's mission, goals, and values, to include definitions for attending school regularly, parent, parenting student, and unlawful absence. Um, in paragraph 3A, to outline the board's expectations for attendance. Um, in paragraph 3C, to add language to mirror um, what's found in state regulation and to include implementing rule under related policies, which includes a hyperlink to implement superintendent's rules in board docs. Any questions? Mr. Thomas. Thank you. So I have a number of amendments for this policy, um, Ms. Ms. Rowe, and I know that we are running short on time, but I, they, they are, these are important amendments uh, to, to, that I would like to introduce. Um, All right, so in the listen, in the interest of time, I would request that committee members um, ask questions about the amendments and take up their speaking time to inform their own vote because we need to move on. And if you know how you're going to vote, um, we need to move this along rather quickly. Um, Mr. Thomas, go ahead and please put your motion in chat so I can read it. I will. It's a, it's a pretty large amendment, um, so it may need to be broken down, but I just want to put it in the chat now. Um, so I move to amend policy 5120 to add the language. The board recognizes there are circumstances in which a student must participate in other activities relating to the student's well-being and extracurricular responsibilities to section 1B, which would just this would this is for um, the this is this would relate to the further amendments um, to then and B, uh, students may be excused from class or school to participate in well-being activities that support positive physical and or mental health so that a student may return to and access instruction to section 3B and C, students may be excused from class or school to participate in activities relating to extracurricular activities, civic engagement, and or community service to section 3C. Is there a second? Is there a second? 
I feel like it needs to be broken up. <laughs> it's, it's okay, so lot. let's um, let's separate the motion. Okay, can we with the first is one? Time that... for question first. Yes. Um, so I'm wondering um, if that's not covered in the policy statement um, by the phrase participating in activities that have been approved as part of the student's instruction during the school day um, seems to encompass the it's it's more generic than the motion speaks to. But if if those activities are um, pre approved already, it the policy statement seems to um, be all encompassing and include the um, activities mentioned in the motion. So I'm wondering if this is necessary. If I may, uh, Ms. Ten, you're you're right. That broader language would incorporate um, or address these issues, and um, to include like the mental uh, wellness piece. If it, if a student is um, uh, doing something that, let's say, uh, is part of a therapeutic uh, something um, to support them with their mental health, that would also already be covered. So, thank you, Dr. McCullough. OK, does the committee still decide to break these out and look at them each separately because we can separate the question? Um, so the first one is. Uh, Miss Rowe, if I may request, yes? can we start with the second two? Uh, the first one relates to the second two. Um, I see. Yeah. Um, OK, so we will start with students may be excused from class or school to participate in well-being activities that support positive physical and or mental health so that a student may return to and access instruction. Is there a second? Hearing none, the motion fails for lack of second. C is uh, Mr. Thomas moves that students may be excused from class or school to participate in activities related to extracurricular activities, civic engagement and or community service. Is there a second? Hearing none, the motion fails for lack of second. And then back to the first one, the board recognizes there are circumstances in which a student must participate in other activities relating to the student's well-being and extracurricular responsibilities. Is there a second? Hearing none, the motion fails for lack of second. Um, did one of you just post a question now? To Now we're back to questions on the policy itself. Oh, I had a so question about the motion. Well, the motion failed, so let's focus back on the policy because we need to move along. Well, we don't I'm not need to sure debate a motion. There's would... no second. OK, I, I'm just not sure whether I would second it if if I have a question about it, but do I? If you have a question about the policy. You can ask a question about the policy. OK, well, I think other people were before me in asking questions about the policy, so if you want to go back to that. OK, who is next so I can find my place in the chat? I believe, I believe OK. Um, my question is my question that I ask in open session in um, the section two definitions. Uh, attending school regularly is defined in Baltimore County Public Schools as the state standard of 94% for satisfactory attendance. So my question is um, in section three under standards, all students are expected to attend school regularly. Do we have to specify 94% attendance or is it absolutely linked to the 94 percent for satisfactory attendance. Does the definition of regularly as 94 percent, is it implied in Section 3 standards? Yes. OK, thank you. Dr. Hager. Um, I was I was hesitating to potentially second Mr. Thomas's motion earlier and I was it just was taking me a minute because I our is participation in civic engagement or community service is that an unexcused absence as currently as it stands 
Um, I'm going to go back to the policy statement. So if the student is participating in activities that, that have been approved as a part of the student's instruction during the school day, then that's an, that's an excuse absence. That's that's right. OK, sorry. It, it was that was my only question just to follow up to make sure I, I understood it correctly. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. So I'm going to be very specific then. So if a student was to attend a demonstration in Annapolis uh, during legislative session uh, and that was not related to a club that they were involved in or to a class that they're involved in, that could be excused. If they had approval, if it was approved. OK, what's the approval process? So that that conversation, once again, they would have to talk to their um, perhaps to the teacher or the administrator over that particular um, grade level and have that conversation about being excused to attend an activity to see whether or not it is a connection to the school day or to instruction. If it's not, then it's not an excuse absence. Right, OK, so the reason that I had made that that one motion was because I, I felt that sometimes those actions don't connect to what's happening in the school day or what's being what we're learning in the school day. But I do feel as though students should be excused for being civically engaged. But you know that wasn't second, so we can have a discussion on that. Um, and also uh, I, I have a question about mental health um, um, students. So the, the, the reason that I, what I had said before, I was reading a Montgomery County policy um, and it states uh, kind of verbatim that students can participate in well-being activities that support positive physical and or mental health. Um, and so as it stands right now, can students be excused from school for taking a break for mental health purposes, for relieving anxiety, for taking a moment to try to calm down so that uh, you know we can access instruction if a parent wants to approve, or is there some type of other approval process that's in place right now? So they, they would need to be, that would need to be part of a therapeutic process. So it's uh, to be genuine, a student couldn't just wake up and say, you know, I'm feeling too stressed today. I'm not, I'm not going to go to school, right? But if a student is uh, working with a therapist and there are um, therapeutic um, procedures that need to be followed, uh, that's where, again, that gets into the partnership with with the school and understanding the therapeutic needs and that how that would be uh, potentially an excused uh, reason. We need to be thoughtful um, around supporting students, absolutely, but we also need to be um, rigorous in our expectation that students are in attendance um, as often as possible. So there is a balance there and we seek to work with families around uh, fam student well-being. Uh, but with all, without giving it just a free pass to say I'm having a, a tough day, I just need to to not uh, go. Sorry, Miss Ferguson, I know I kind of probably stole your thunder. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. Ms. Okay. Fawzi? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Thomas. Were you not finished? Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, I, I'm a student right now and I can say that this past year with COVID-19 has been incredibly stressful and incredibly busy. And there were times during the virtual day when I was running for a smob as I was dealing with so many other things that I didn't log into my virtual classroom and I took a day to breathe and I was marked absent. And then because I was not in school at that time virtually, I was unable to complete a test that day that I, I forgot was scheduled that day. And I was refused to be allowed to have the opportunity to make up that test, resulting in a grade that I do not feel reflects my performance in the class. So I felt very passionately about that part of, of what I had proposed. And I really wanted to have a discussion about that because I do think we need to be looking at whether or not students can take breaks and be excused and be able to make up work because our staff members do, our teachers can, they, they have the opportunity to have uh, a sick days. They have the opportunity to have um, um, days off throughout the school year while, while still being paid. But students, you know, we have an obligation to be in school. But yet that obligation is, you know, we can't ever we, we can't request a day off unless we have unless we have some type of documentation, you know, supporting that we, we can be off because of, of our sickness. So I, I think that I, I, I'd love to continue to have conversations about this, so I don't think I, I want to continue to discuss this policy. Um, and for things like extracurricular activities, you know, the, the, the approval process for that I, I think the board should be very clear that we are encouraging our students to be civically engaged. We are encouraging our students to participate in community service. And sometimes, you know, I feel as though our if we don't have this in policy, we might not actually have an opportunity for students to do those things. Students 
may not go down to Annapolis and, and, and lobby as I have done this school year because their administrators might not uh, allow them to have, 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 have an excused absence for that day. So again, those are some things that I, I just think we should consider um, and I'd love to uh, hear board members consider. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tom. Um, Ms. Causey. Thank you to dovetail in this very important discussion. Um, where is the parents' um, authority in terms of um, providing an excused uh, documentation for excused absence for their student? I was uh, reading the superintendent's rule um, after our policy states um, vaguely about state regulations, and um, it wasn't clear um what is the parent's role so for instance there's sickness um and it was my understanding that the parent can write a note for sickness um up to a certain number of days and then they need a uh, a doctor's note but i don't see that in in the rule so where what is the parent's um where's the parent's authorization where's their authority in writing an excuse note. So Ms. Are we talking about the rule or the policy? Well, we're talking about the policy because I think it should be clear in the policy um, what parents have authority to determine is an appropriate excused absence for their student. And, and to um, the earlier board member's point, um, a student may have a day where they, um, a parent may decide that they need to just rest, but may not need to seek medical attention at that point. Now, the second day, then maybe they say, oh, we need to seek some, some medical attention, some, some healthcare professional intervention, you know, or talk to the school counseling. Uh, so, uh, so, so it's unclear to me where, where the parent's authority is what what that authority is so in the rule under lawful absence illness of the student illness of the student is listed listed okay and there's not a <clears throat> uh, number of days that it's limited to the parent to say that they're <laughs> ill or is it so um, it specifically reads the principal <clears throat> or people personnel worker may re require a physician certificate from the parent or guardian of a student reported continuously absent for illness. It doesn't have a number of days beside it. And that's in the rule. That's in the rule. Yes. In the po in the policy, um, it just indicates lawful absences. So then who? who determines continuously who is it two days continuously is it three days continuously so in our um th there is a um there's a verification of absences um that in the rule as well i'm, I'm scanning really quickly because i've been focusing on the policy i've been since that's what we were talking about um there is an absent note section under 5B, a student absent from school shall present a note to the school principal immediately upon return to school. Um, has to be signed by the guardian. The absence note, here we are, uh, shall be submitted to the school principal no later than five days after the student's return to school. Um, talks about different ways of receiving that. And then if the student is absent for extended period of time due to illness, a written statement of explanation may be required from the physician no later than five days after the student's return to class. So it looks like that five days is the magic number here. Okay, thank you. And is there any authority of the parents to uh, provide for an excused absence for civic engagement or some other thing that's not illness? That's not included here. Um, that is that would be an unexcused absence. absence. That's not a lawful absence. Once okay. again, it, that would go back to 
the standard when we talk about participating in activities that have been, been approved as part of the student's instruction during the okay. school day. And, and so our board policies are have limitations um, given to us by the state, correct? I'm not sure what your question is. So the board may the board may feel believe that something's important, but if the state law has given us guidance, we have to follow we, yes, the state's we do, guidance. We, we do follow the state's guidance, yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. I would appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Yes, one second, Ms. Rowe. You can come back to me. I think somebody else had a comment. I'm not sure that anyone else did on this. I think you're the uh, last one. I, oh. I, I have a comment to dovetail on what Ms. Causey was saying. I, I so it says in the in the new language, um, so the, the, the whole policy is called attendance and excuses, and there isn't a lot in there on the excuses side. Um, the new language says may be excused from class or school only for reasons specified in state regulation. And I also was going through the rule and looking for links. And are, are, is it a list of the state regulations or is, is, it, is there kind of a, a better way to summarize that? Just it seems very vague. Um, and I, um, is it just illness? Is it a doctor's note is the only thing that's excusable? There is a list of lawful and unlawful absences in the rule. I didn't see that. I'm sorry. I was looking. Section three. Section three. Thank you. Ms. Hunter, are you ready now or should I move on to Mr. Thomas? I am. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Sorry. I have a motion I'm putting in the chat. I move to amend the policy to insert the board expects all families and students to prioritize regular school attendance and and the word and before expect students to be physically present at school So the language that you're inserting is therefore the board expects all families and students to prioritize regular school attendance. Correct. Is there a second to this motion? Second, Mac. Um, any questions or comments or can we just vote? I, I have a question. Yeah, what's the what's the purpose again of the of? of Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you for asking, Mr. Thomas. I'll speak briefly to this since um, your comments actually inspired this motion. I think there are a lot of competing activities um, that are of value and that it's important that we state that attendance should be first priority um, because of its impact on achievement. And that while we recognize that those other activities do hold value, that they don't replace the value of being in a classroom or in a virtual classroom and the learning environment and the learning that takes place there um, in terms of regular um, instruction and that we recognize those other activities. You know, students have a lot of things competing for their interest, but it doesn't replace the value of regular attendance. So we don't have a statement anywhere in the policy that states that regular attendance, we state that it's important, but not that it's priority. And I think sometimes families struggle with prioritization um, and students certainly do with so many things competing for their, their interest that a priority statement um, added to our vision, I believe is important. And the role that families play in helping their students prioritize attendance and is part of our goals as a board in increasing family engagement. And we've talked about um, the, the important role that families do play in helping uh, you know, with the school system in setting expectations. So that's why they're mentioned as well. But thank you for asking. Thank you. And so what does it mean when it says regular school attendance? Does that mean being in a school in the classroom? We define that in the policy itself um, in 1A, attending school regularly, and then that's defined in 2A. 
to a. Okay, because like I guess my only concern is here. Well, like when we say, therefore the board expects all family students to prioritize regular school attendance. I I I'm thinking of like, does regular school attendance in the way and I'm asking for Miss Howie or, or uh, Miss Ferguson to respond. Would that include like field trips? Does that include going to student government conferences? Does that include going to Future Business Leaders of America conferences and all those other things that students do uh, to uh, kind of substantiate their their learning in the classroom? Yes, Mr. Thomas, they would fall under the, the school sanctioned pre approved instructional aspects, so they would fall under that category. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Causey. Thank you. I um, I just wanted to support Ms. Hen's um, comments, but also to say that the the board's work is to provide uh, effective and efficient um, excellent, equitable education to all children. And um, the fact is that when students are absent, it affects not only the student, but it also affects the teachers who then have to um, work outside of the class time or in some other ways to make up, to help make up for the student um, what they're, you know, what they have missed with that instructional time, whether it's in person or whether it's virtual. Um, so it has an impact on the entire operations and efficiency of the school system. Um, and while they have um, great procedures to, to try and do that, obviously the more and more exceptions there are to the standards of operations, the more difficult it is for uh, the work to be done in, in the best method. So I appreciate this uh, the opportunity to make this a clear expectation. Uh, Ms. Clark, can you please call the roll on the motion to add the language? Therefore, the board expects all families and students to prioritize regular school attendance and. Ms. Causey? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Is there, are there any further amendments to um, policy 5120? Okay. If there are no further amendments, poly, policy 5120 is moved as amended forward for first reading as presented. All in favor of policy 5120 moving to first reader as amended, please answer yes when your name is called. Those opposed, please answer no. If you are not ready to vote, answer pass, and you will be called on again after the roll has been completely called. Ms. Clark, please call the roll. Ms. Causey? Ms. Causey? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. Thomas? No. Thank you. OK, the motion carries. Before we move on, I'd like to take a look at the agenda briefly because this meeting has to end at six because staff cannot stay and we are going to need to. We're not going to complete everything on this agenda, so we need to figure out what we're not going to do. And I believe Ms. Hen, you had a motion to that aspect. I do. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. I move to postpone item 4A. Or I'm sorry, item 4B, policy 5550, student behavior code and policy 5560, suspensions and expulsions to the May meeting. Is there any objection to postponing that item? OK, hearing none, that item will be postponed. Thank you. Um, Ms. Howie, do you have recommendations on what we can likely complete in the next 20 minutes? And perhaps maybe we should discuss when we're going to have this additional meeting and postpone everything else because we have got to find a way as a committee to work through our agenda and finish our agenda and the main problem i see to getting that done is that our deliberation often spends a lot of time convincing other committee members of how they should vote as opposed to asking questions to inform our own votes so we're either going to have to become more concise about how we do business as a committee 
or we're going to have to have a lot more meetings. And that means that we're going to have to have meetings sometimes when staff are available, even if it's not convenient for us, or we're not going to be effective at the committee. So if we could discuss um, when we're going to have this additional meeting. Ms. Howie, where is that on the agenda? I'm not so seeing it's, it it's, easily. Um, item D, uh, as in David three, but members of the committee, you do have policy 5100 compulsory attendance, which was brought back. Uh, because of questions at the last meeting and there uh, there is some relationship to policy 5120 which you've just sent forward uh, the staff brought uh, policy 5100 back because questions might be answered in conjunction with 5120. well if we can hurry up and agree on dates we can have a meeting we can go back to that but i don't want to not have a discussion about additional meetings and so this meeting without having done that. There were five uh, possible dates, March 28th, March 30th, March 31st, April 6th and April 25th. OK, and the time for this meeting? The question was whether or not the committee wished to start earlier. So uh, whether or not you wish to start at 3.30, which is what you did today, or start at 4.30, which is the time that you've used before. Does anyone object to beginning committee meetings at 3.30 in the future? OK, it, let's do that then. It would, not be my, sorry. It, it would not be my first preference, but if we do it occasionally, I'd be fine with it. We need to do something all the time because we're not covering our agenda. We're not even coming close and we have a lot to do. And what's going to happen is if we don't if we can't um, finish our agenda, we're going to just have things that are pushed to the end of the agenda all the time that just get, keep getting perpetually postponed that don't happen. And we're only going to end up covering the things that have a legal mandate because those will be the things we do first. So like today, we only covered the policies that have a legal mandate. Um, OK, so. Monday, March 28th. Uh, I just wanted to state that. Um, that works for me at 4.30. The week of that last week of March, I am I, pretty much unavailable at 3.30, but I can do any time at 3.30 in April. Um, but if, if the committee would prefer to start earlier, then I'm fine with that and I can just join late. I just have you know what? Let's do this. Let's do this um, a little bit easier way. Um, put in chat the dates that you are available. At 3.30? Or just put your caveat if you're not available at a particular time, but let's assume that these dates mean 3.30. And Thursday, March 31st, for people who are going on the NSBA conference, that could be somewhat problematic because I'm, I think some of us might be flying out on Friday. I'm not sure. Ms. Howie, are you collecting all these dates? Yes, ma'am. OK, and Ms. Han said that she could do any date, but 4 p.m. would be preferable. Is there any objection to selecting multiple of these dates? Because we have a lot to do and we're not finishing what we have to do. I have no objection to that. OK, there does not appear to be an objection to that. So Ms. Howie, um, you and Ms. Han and I can figure out in an agenda setting meeting how many dates we need to get through this because this committee appears to be covering three policies per meeting the way we're going now. Um, so we need to. Uh, we need to do better than that. 
or we need to have a lot more meetings. I'm happy to have as many meetings as you guys want to have. Um, okay. Ms. Howie, there was a policy that you wanted to cover today that was related to discipline. Uh, not to discipline, but to attendance. It oh, was to attendance. I'm from sorry. the last meeting. So that is policy 5100 compulsory attendance. Ms. Rowe, may I address this? Yes. I believe that I at least was at one person who raised a concern, but it was the definition of regularly which has been included in the policy. So if I was the only person with a concern, I I now see the definition I and I'm fine with it. OK. Um, is that the consensus of everyone else? Yes. OK, so move to move 5100. I'm going to yeah, I'm going to skip right to reading for. Um, there are no corrections. Policy 5100 is moved forward to the first meeting as amended all in favor of policy 5100 moving to first reader as presented please answer yes when your name is called those opposed please answer no if you're not ready to vote answer pass and you will be called on again after the roll has been completely called miss cart please call the roll miss causey pass dr hager yes miss hen yes miss Mack. yes Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Causey? I'm going to abstain. Okay, the Thank motion you. carries. Um, Ms. Howie, do you see anything else on here that you think that we can finish in 10 minutes? So members of the committee, you do have before you uh, re staff recommendations concerning uh, the Office of the Inspector General report. Uh, those are uh, changes are being presented to you in gross in policies 3200, 3209, and 3210. The same language is being presented, is being recommended for all three of those policies. Uh, the analysis outlines uh, the issue that uh, the Office of the Inspector General wanted addressed uh, and the language that has been recommended to be added to all of these policies is um, as follows. The board will comply with all contract solicitation and procurement procedures as outlined in Section 5.1.12 of the Education Article. We have also uh, placed in the uh, legal references uh, in addition to 5112, the State Finance and Procurement Article, as well as Comar Article 210507. Uh, Are there any questions or discussion on this agenda item? Madam Chair, I would not be um, ready to move these forward without. Uh, time for discussion. It's three significant policies uh, with um, significant um, ramifications. So I think what the idea is, is to change specifically the things in these policies that are required by our corrective action plan, as opposed to going through and exhaustively reviewing each and every policy which there is really no way that we can do. We just, we can't even get through what we're doing now. So that was the solution that I thought would meet our legal demands. And then as these policies come in for review, then we can do the in-depth um, type of thing. Ms. Rowe? Um, Ms. Ten? Yes, I agree. Um, it's simple language. It meets our requirements um, for the OIDE report, and it's the same language in each of these policies. I would support moving them forward for the reasons you stated. Okay. Um, is there anyone who has any amendments, changes, questions? I have a question. Uh, Mr. Thomas? Thank you. So, Ms. Howie, Ms. Rowe, Ms. Hen. Uh, 
if we were to approve this in the way that's currently written, just to abide by the, you know, the recommendations of the OIG, um, will these policies still come up again in the review cycle or will it refresh and start over at seven years? No, we would, they would be on the review cycle that they're currently on. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Cosby, did you have an additional question or was that from before? I had an additional question uh, as to um, whether it's been reviewed by the board council or um, with MAVE or the Office of Internal Audit related to the corrective action plan. And if so, what were the comments? No, ma'am, this was not sent to board council. Are there any other questions? Okay, if there are no corrections, And I have to find the right one in this group. If there are no corrections, policy 3200, 3209, and 3210 are moved forward for first reader as presented. All in favor of policies 3200, 3209, and 3210 moving to first reader as presented, please answer yes or when your name is called. Those opposed, please answer no. If you are not ready to vote, please pass, and you will be called on again after the roll has been completed. Ms. Clark, please call the roll. Ms. Causey? No. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Han? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Passes. Okay, the motion passes. Those policies will be moved to first reader. Ms. Rowe? Yes, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I was just remembering something that was stated earlier about the first policy reviewed, policy 2A, uh, 5480. Ms. Howie had mentioned that the Roman numerals were not correct uh, with the standards and implementation. I'm wondering if before, can we revisit that and possibly fix the she Roman will cor numerals? She'll it's, correct those yes, when it goes okay. to the full board. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there anything we can complete in five minutes, Ms. Howie? Um, Dr. McComas indicates that policy 1270 should go quickly. So, uh, Dr. McComas? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. Um, coming, um, I'm going to quickly turn it over to Ms. Hahn. Uh, this is an annual policy, and, and we have our Title I team standing by to support that process. So, Ms. Hahn, take it away. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Boswell McComas. I'll talk quickly. Good evening, committee members and colleagues. I will be presenting policy 1270 parent and family engagement. Um, policy 1270 validates the Board of Ed's belief and commitment to meaningful partnerships among schools, families, caregivers, and community members in providing a sustainable system of support for the academic and personal success of students. The COMPASS is how BCPS puts family and community engagement into action to realize our vision. Focus Area 4, Community Engagement and Partnerships, addresses the need for BCPS to establish and maintain a high level of inclusive family and community engagement and increased partner effectiveness. This policy substantiates the shared vision of the Board of Ed that families, caregivers, and communities play a key role in supporting academic achievement and ensuring that students are prepared for career and or college opportunities. The impact of having a board supported parent and family policy refines the commitment of improving engagement to transforming how stakeholder engagement is valued within BCPS. Approval of policy 1270 will move the system forward by creating conditions supportive of family engagement programs that have been developed in collaboration with families and community partners. Thank you, questions? Mr. Thomas, very quickly, very quickly. quickly. Yes, thank you, thank you. So this policy does not include any 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 sort of student engagement. I know that we have the Office of Family and Community Engagement. Um, so I'm wondering then, uh, would you would you advise including student engagement here, or should we create a separate policy that relates to student engagement? Um, 
I'm I not familiar if one already exists. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I would I would suggest, Mr. Thomas, that's something that we can look at in terms of specific um, student engagement, because this is really about this particular policy is really about ensuring that we are uh, acting in good faith effort to engage parents and guardians. Um, so I hear your concern, and I think uh, to fully address that in the in the spirit of what I think you would want, uh, it, I think we would need to consider it in its own um, area. OK, thank you. OK, in my pleasure. Dr. Hager. Um, I would just another related policy we could consider adding to the list would be the wellness policy, which requires parent and, and uh, community engagement in wellness activities. That's it. Okay, are there any other questions for this policy? We have literally two minutes to pass this thing, and then we will adjourn at six. Um, Ms. Ms. Causey. Oh, okay. Ms. Causey. So, um, my issue was about the PRC committee operations as a whole, not about this policy. Um, we're, let, can you and I discuss that offline and I can figure out what it is your concern is? Because we have no time to do that. We have exactly one minute left. Certainly, that's uh, what I asked you. Yeah. OK, all in favor of policy 1270 <laughs> moving to first reader as presented, please answer yes. I have a question. I'm sorry, go ahead, Ms. Ann, very quickly. Yes, um, in the vision, it states that we are committed to family engagement and recognize that it plays a key role in supporting academic achievement. And I'm wondering if there is a program that assists families with access to their students' curriculum and in providing homework help and how this policy addresses that, because that's something substantial that I believe it needs to address. And is I don't see that here. Am I missing something? Um, in the rule, uh, we do talk about supporting um, student achievement, um, but I don't think we necessarily mention um, access to curriculum. Right, okay, it is six. We I need to vote or we need I to adjourn and move this item to the next meeting. Ms. Rowe, I would move to send this policy back to staff to add language about um, providing families with access to curriculum to support okay. the of supporting stu um, academic achieve student the, academic achievement. The rest of these items will be moved. The rest of the, this agenda items that we didn't finish will be moved to another meeting. Um, Ms. Howie, if you could keep track of those for our agenda setting meeting. Um, and it is six o'clock. Staff have to leave. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you all.